Announcer Bunny here from Between the Lions. And now, you're watching the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it. Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I'll be here with us. Thank you for joining. As always, I'm your host, Jake Duffenbaugh. Who today is always our co-hosts, uh, Chris Bixby and Matt Bingo. How are you guys doing? Doing Good. terrific. Hello, everybody. How are you, Jake? I'm doing great, Matt. Thank you for asking. Yes, and, and, um, and Chris, we have... what do we also have for this special episode yes we have a guest co-host joining us it's been a while since we've had a guest co-host he's one of uh, my good friends who i've known for a couple years now his name is cole how are you doing cole hello everyone i'm actually really excited to be part of this podcast for this episode uh yes, we're happy to have you here very happy to have you here yes Glad so here. yes so jake who do we have for today well today's guest we have for today he's a puppeteer director and puppet designer you, you know him from a lot of Projects we will touch base on later, including Between the Lions, It's a Big Big World, Ubi, Giant Sports, Crush and Burn Scene, and many others we will touch base on later. And he also, we're also going to discuss his puppeteering work with, with the Muppets as well. Please welcome Mr. Tim Legassi. How about have you here, Tim? Hi, here? kids. How about have you here? How are you? I'm uh, I'm okay. I'm okay. How's everyone doing? Awesome. So pleasure to have you here, Tim. So uh, um so to start this off, um we know who you are, but for those who don't, would you care? Uh, would you care to tell our audience a bit about yourself and what you do? Um. So I have been a working puppeteer and puppet artist in television and film for the last thirty plus years. I got my start. I have a a, a degree in puppet arts from the University of Connecticut. I graduated in nineteen ninety two from uh, um, uh it's the only school in the country you can get a degree in puppetry uh and uh, uh and i kind of just but but two years after graduating i got my first series on nickelodeon i was on um uh, uh allegra's window i played i was the youngest puppeteer and i played the oldest character and uh i've been uh lucky lucky so lucky enough to be uh as a puppeteer and a director and a puppet builder ever since awesome Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. So, what, what what was your background like, and how did you grow up? Uh, I grew up. Uh, I was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, the town that uh, Paul Newman called the armpit of Connecticut, uh, and it was also the town that was once the, the mayor was once P.T. Barnum, uh, oh, nice. and huh. uh, wow. yeah, yeah. And I, uh, uh, at one point, I was in uh, high school in Connecticut, and uh, I was going to, and you could see in West Haven and out the back windows of this high school you could see yale and all the teachers like you're all going to go to yale and be lawyers and doctors and i i didn't i wasn't the best of students uh i've been a very unusual child uh i uh, but uh i opened up a magazine one day and i was already doing puppets and theater and art and things like that and trying to figure out and and up to that point in high school where they make you take all the tests mm -hmm. to see what you're going to be when you grow up uh, see, we didn't have computers back then, so they were like little checklists, and they would go through and they would tell you. Uh, and uh, I kept saying I should be a graphic designer or something like that. That's that was a that was the only respectable art job at the time in the '90s. And uh, I opened up a magazine, and there was an article about uh, a school in Connecticut where you can get a degree, a college degree, and in puppetry. And a lot of people that graduated from that program went to work for the Muppets. And I was like, wait a minute. That's a job. That's a job that you can go to college for. Uh, and I went home and told my parents and they weren't very happy about it. Uh, I don't know who whose parents would be. <laughs> uh, show business is not an easy lifestyle. Uh, and but uh, I it, it really fit me and my skill set. Uh, I am uh, I'm kind of an ADD kind of a person. And the thing about puppetry is it fills your brain. You have to do so many things at once, and you know, and you get to do many things. You get to do art and sculpting and music and dance and acting and designing and sewing, and you have to learn a lot of things. And I just wanted to learn a lot of things, and it, it required me to know all these things. So it uh, uh, it seems to have fit me pretty well. I've been doing it for a little while. 
Nice. Uh, and, and, yeah. and then I, I was lucky enough to be, while I was in puppet school, there was uh, the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center started doing a puppetry conference. And the very first conference was uh, Learn How to Be a Muppet. Uh, it was uh, taught to do puppetry by Jane Henson and Marty Robinson and Kathy. Oh, Mullen wow. And Pam wow. Arciero. I love Marty. They were the, yeah, and then, and then Marty, is, names. Marty is one of my best friends, but he was my first mentor. Uh, and then uh, learn how to build puppets with Peter McKinnon, who's one of the best puppet builders ever. Just um, and, and just an um, amazing human being. And at the end of that week, a bunch I was still in school, and a bunch of people kind of went off. Peter Lintz went off, and he started right, working for the Muppets right away. And Heather Ash went off from that week and started building for them right away. And I had another year of college, uh, and I kept in touch with Marty and Kathy Mullen. And Kathy Mullen had some weird projects uh, that she kept hiring me for. I, I kind of mentored under her for a while, which was great. She's such an amazing performer and an amazing teacher. And then uh, they were doing a, a, a kid's show for Nickelodeon and they hired Kathy Mullen and they had lost this puppeteer. This one puppeteer just kind of vanished. They had hired as a part and they didn't know what to do. And she went, you should call Tim Legas." And uh, they, uh, uh, and, and uh, Marty auditioned me. I ran in, I was working at uh, Pennsylvania, a job and they called me in. I raced, I got on the train back to New York and I did the day audition and I, uh, did with a couple things with a puppet and Marty Robinson went, you're better than I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was the best compliment I could have gotten. Uh, and I got that part. And once you get one kind of TV job, people kind of know you as someone that's maybe good enough to be on TV and you, you, you kind of snowball. It's getting that first one is usually the, uh, the kind of cracking into uh, television puppetry. So, I'm, but you know, at, at the same time I was, people were hiring me to build weird puppets for them. Uh, always i'll always build weird puppets for every for anybody <laughs> happily <laughs> that's the short version <laughs> so uh getting into puppetry who were like some of your biggest inspirations obviously jim henson but uh i am old enough i am way older than all of you that when i was a kid in connecticut you we got all the new york television uh, I could Kukla, Fran, and Ollie were on it super early, on uh, like six a.m. on Saturday mornings, uh, and I and uh, and I had such an obsession with them. And I'm as old as Sesame Street. If you want to know how old I am, look at what season of uh, Sesame Street it is. That's exactly how old I am. <laughs> I was born oh, in wow. 1969, uh, so I uh, uh, I grew up. I was in that Muppet era. I was raised by Sesame Street and Muppet Show came around just at the right age for me to love the Muppet Show and all the Muppet movies. I was that was my uh, um, era. Uh, but at the same time, I fell in love with puppetry and I started going and magic. And I used to go to the library all the time. I love the library. And in the Dewey Decimal System right next to each other is Puppets, Magic, Origami. They're all on the same shelf. And uh, so I was pulling out all those books and there's a great book, one of the best books on puppetry ever called The Art of the Puppet by Bill Baird. And it is a beautiful book. And you start going through that book and seeing all these other things. And I was fascinated by marionettes and stuff like that. And I used to tear apart my sister's stuffed animals and try to turn them into marionettes and, and my dad's lumber and make controllers. Terrible, terrible puppets I made. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I love the Cooklin Franali. Uh, I love, of course, the, uh, the Lonely Goat Herd is the Bill Baird. You guys, that's how you guys would know Bill Baird. The Lonely Goat Herd segment from right. Sound of Music, those marionettes, those are the Bill Baird marionettes. If I can get a little nerdy on you, I did go to puppet school. If there was no Bill Baird, there'd be no Jim Henson. That's Bill right. Baird was Jim Henson's hey. biggest influence. And Bill Baird was like the Jim Henson of his time. And before him, it was, they all, all the puppeteers trained with Tony Sarg. Tony Sarg, known for designing the balloons for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Those Ooh. are puppets. They were originally puppets. They were reverse pup reverse marionettes. They're buoyant marionettes and then perform from below. And there's pictures of Bill Baird and Marco and Rufus Rose, who did Howdy Doody, all worked for Tony Sarg. So if there was no Tony Sarg, there'd be no Bill Baird. If there was no Bill Baird, there'd be no Jim Henson. Uh, and I just fell in love with all that stuff. And when I got to school, I remember they were getting back up again. And I was like, oh, I know these puppets. I know these things. Uh, I'm also a, I was also a huge fan of Monty Python. Ah, uh, uh, yes. And gotta love Monty uh, Python. Yeah. And yeah, you know, my favorite thing about you know it's really Muppet Show was my influence because all those weird segments I fell madly in love with all those weird variety segments that all got pulled from those variety shows that Jim did back in the day. Jim did all those on the, on the Ed Sullivan Show and other shows. All these weird puppet segments. 
that was my love. That's what I, I, I love the strange performance art, yet still weirdly entertaining. Like the Wilkins and Wilkins co uh, commercials and stuff like that. That's my. I that's love those commercials. Right. I just, yeah, it's just punch and Judy humor, just like slapstick. I know you can't fire guns on TV anymore, and I get that, but just by puppets yeah. getting shot by the cannon, all that Bugs Bunny, all the Bugs Bunny cartoons, I they used to be on rerun all the time. Uh, and I used to watch all those all the time. So I think that's kind of my, you know, uh, clowny ilk, I guess. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, yeah. You, you, had, yeah. you had mentioned you had mentioned New York uh, puppet shows. Do you remember the Magic Garden by any chance? Oh, of course, the Magic Garden with the pink squirrel and the giggle patch. Yeah, yeah, see, yeah. See, yeah. Hope you had a good, good time. Uh huh. <laughs> Hope yeah, you had I, I, I just thought of that. Uh, well, there were I, only I just, five channels. I there were only five yeah. channels and all that yeah. you could get. Maybe six if you went over to UHF. You have the PBS channels like that. But so you watched right. all the kid shows that were on, and that's what we got. We got uh, um, Wonderama, and, mm -hmm. and and uh, and what was that show called? That with the pink squirrel. That was the Magic Garden. Magic the, Garden. The Magic right? Garden. Yep. I, Terrible puppetry. Have you watched it recently? Oh, the top puppetry that not squirrel, in a bit, not in a that, bit. I'm a snob now. I'm a horrible snob, and I, of course, I loved that show as a kid, and I watch it now. I'm like, oh my god. Uh, Go back and watch Kukla Friend and Ollie. We make fun of Kukla Friend and Ollie all the time on set because the the way that the 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 um, I'm looking. I have a Kukla Friend and Ollie board game over here. I'm looking at, but Ollie, oh, wow, uh, Ollie was uh, you know you know normally when you talk you try to try to hit every syllable. Now the modern way we do lip sync, but Ollie mm -hmm. would talk like this. Okay, Kukla, what are we gonna do today? All right, it's like one flap for every sentence, and it was like, "What are we? Oh, we watched the show." <laughs> right, <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Um. Do you remember what your first professional job at puppeteering was? As puppeteer, um, I guess it kind of we did a, a a video while we were in college. We got hired to do a video for the Lyme Disease Foundation about doing uh, uh, doing a tick check, so you didn't get Lyme disease. And they had hired, and I got uh, they hired. They asked me to make all the puppets, and it was my, Bart Rocket Burton was the was running the puppetry program at the time. He is now. He's the new head of the program. I was there for uh, Frank Ballard, who started the program. I had two years of Frank, and then he had to retire because he had Parkinson's. You can't teach puppetry when your hands are shaking. And then Bart took over. And Bart got this job, but he gave it to all of us. So I designed and built the puppets. And Emilio Delgado was the human from Sesame Street. Oh, and we all got soul, and we did a silly video. Which it's it's I think you can kind of find it. It might be out there. It's not my best work. It was my early work, but I think that was my first puppetry. Getting paid to be a puppeteer. Uh my first job was uh I built uh the Baba Booey puppet for Howard Stern. Oh wow. Uh, I was in the puppet oh. lab and the phone rang and someone on the Stern show. This is before he was on E. He was at, had a show on WR9. He was still a radio DJ and just started to do like a, a local TV show. And they went, we want a puppet of Bob Bowie. And he said, I bet you we can get a cheap puppet if we call puppet school. So he called puppet school and I answered <laughs> the phone and I knew who Stern was. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, I'll do that for you. $200. They stole that puppet. <laughs> <laughs> But I've got another job because of that puppet. I'd be like, who's the guy who built the, the Baba Booey puppet? I've gotten uh, people find me because they want to know who built that puppet for Stern. And then Stern called me many years later. They wanted a second one for the movie. And I gave them a real price. And they went, thank you. Bye. And they never. <laughs> 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 I, I'm a little more expensive now. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Uh, inflation. Inflation. You know. Right. Yes. Definitely. So you had mentioned this uh, early on in your career. You puppeteered Mr. Cook and Tweeter on the Nick Jr. series Allegra's Window. Correct. One wonderful show, by the way. Oh, um, thank you. What was, what, what was that? What was doing that show like? So imagine you're a kid who always wanted to be work for the Muppets, and you get hired the show. The show's not by the Muppets. Marty Robinson designed and built all the puppets for this show, and the guy who created uh, Doug. Oh, did all yes, the designs Jim Dickens. and yes, Jim, Jim Dickens, Dickens. Is it Jim Dickens Jim. created the show? Yeah. And Jim, because yes. Jim had done puppet shows before, Jim did yes. a show called Pinwheel that was he before he became yes. an animator. Mm -hmm. Right. So he knew mm -hmm. puppetry and it's it, just a wonderful human. Uh and you get hired by one of your heroes, and then you're working every day with your heroes. So you've got I'm I'm in Kathy Baldwin's armpit every day for helping her and doing characters alongside Pam and Marty. 
and Anthony Asbury, who did Spinning Image, he was there with you. How and then my that? and then my buddy Heather Ash and I were we both were at UConn at the same time together. And they were just kind of like, What how did we get here? But we were all shooting in Orlando. We were shooting at Nickelodeon Studios in Orlando. Uh, so we were all trapped together. So we all kind of became this one this great little family. It was like this really uh, uh and we all got along so well, and the crew down there was so wonderful. It made it set me up that thinking that every TV show was just like this amazing family and you had a great time because we had the best time making the show. We had so much fun. And and Marty driving the bus, we took these giant puppet risks and doing things that, that people puppets had never done at that point before and just trying things and being silly and, and being in Florida. We got to go to Florida every winter. I was, you know, I, they would, we'd fly down at the end of January and shoot for three months and I'd miss the worst of winter. It was like, this is the best job ever. And at lunchtime, you know, we were, Nickelodeon Studios was inside Universal Studios. So every day at lunch, we'd ride back to the future because we just flash our Nickelodeon badges and we'd like sneak onto the ride. We didn't have to pay to get in the park because we were in the park. So we'd sneak on and we'd ride, we'd eat a quick lunch and then we'd ride back to the future and then we'd run back to work because it was on the outside of the park. Uh, it was just <laughs> a blast. So I thought every TV show was going to be like that. Well, it was kind of an anomaly. But, uh, um, uh, uh, and I learned, you learn so much just from being in the room with that kind of talent is watching right. Kathy Mullen work and figure it out and watching us. We had some of the greatest directors from Sesame street too. And watching all these people just do jobs. I became so much better in a short period of time, just being in the room with, with greatness. Absolutely. Uh, um, yeah, definitely. And I know uh, Jake kind of has a, uh, a kind of deep cut question. Uh Oh, yeah, so uh, what was it like getting to work on Once Upon a Tree? That was a weird show. That was a weird <laughs> show. Uh, what happens every once in a while is someone who does what who works in one part of the entertainment industry decides they want to do a children's show. And they want to, when it's usually puppets. And they think that puppets are easy. And uh uh, uh and they and they found and they and they hired uh Marty to build the puppets and they brought me in and like that and uh and they would just get and they hired Lisa uh Simon who was the executive producer of Sesame Street for many years and worked her way up the ranks was a great director and a great friend such a talented lady uh and they brought also in and they were just kind of like why is this so hard I'm like every every puppet shot is an effect shot but what made that show particularly hard was one we were shooting at uh home shopping network studios mm -hmm. so we were in one room shooting a kid's show and they were in the next room they were shooting like bath towels live go on buy some bath towels oh you know <laughs> so we had to walk <laughs> through the warehouse look at all the they're gonna all the junk they were gonna sell that day on home shopping network it was qvc at the time or it was some other name they got bought up later um and this woman that produced it was a uh he was this famous newscaster colleen needles and this was her retiring from, and she wanted to go into television, but she had this local guy that she wanted to play the lead who had never done a puppet. Like, I just love his voice. Can you teach him how to be a puppeteer? It should be easy. Um, it's not. <laughs> to become a puppeteer takes many years. I could teach you, I can get you started, but you need four years of practice to be good enough to be on television. So a lot of hand holding with this one guy. And uh, we, and uh, though uh, Eric Jacobson, who is now, the oh, new okay, Frank right. Oz. It was yeah. me and Eric, really? and Eric's an old friend of mine, and we kind of came up together. And he and I had just a great time working on that. But the hard part was, every once in a while, they would bring on a live animal uh, to be on the show because it was both about animals. And a lot of those segments went very wrong. But the worst one was they brought in a bald eagle. Oh boy. <laughs> Oh I, and, no. And I and I was put and they wanted the puppets, our puppets, to look like they were real. So they have taxidermy eyes and the proper color hair, and they were shaped like real animal. And I they but let's bring the pup the bunny in to talk about the bald eagle. <laughs> so the bald eagle had a a, a a chain around his ankle and he was chained to a, a a log. And I said, Can we drill the log down to the set? And they went, the set's made out of metal. We can't drill to the set. I can't the set because just, it's okay. It's heavy. It'll keep him down. And the actual trainer was offset because we had this actor playing like the animal guy. So the, the person who knows how to handle an eagle is about 
10, 15 feet that way off, off camera. And we have Dr. Dex and me and I'm on the floor and I put the puppet on and the Eagle's looking around and I put the bunny on the Eagle. just does this goes. Hmm. And I'm like, Oh, that Eagle's going to mess me up. So oh. I have these earmuffs that I, and I kind of bend one of the ears and I try to change my silhouette and I get very still and I'm usually a very animated puppeteer. And I was just like, okay, that just tell us all about this baby eagle. And I was like, I'm not moving. I'm not moving. I'm not moving. And then suddenly halfway through the scene, the eagle goes and and goes after me. He flies. And he's, I mean, he's only three feet away, three, four feet away. He's here. Ah. And, he, and he goes and he just, as he goes off of the platform, the chain goes tight. The log falls off of the set and yanks the eagle down and the eagle lands like right here next to me and I'm holding the bunny like this. <laughs> oh just misses me like that eagle. That eagle wanted to eat my hand. Uh, and it was, it was like the one thing I thought, could we do like, this eagle? No, the eagle's not going to go after you. It's a puppet. He doesn't know. Boom. That eagle tried to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I have to say uh, 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 Minnesota in the summer is lovely. So we was, was like that. Luckily, we weren't shooting there in the middle of winter. I had a meeting in the right. middle of winter, yeah. and I was like, yeah. "How does anybody live here in January?" But uh, <laughs> we spent, and Eric Jacobs and I spent all of our time in the uh, in the Mall of America. <laughs> yes, and um, and, and a great friend of ours, a previous guest, uh, Jen Barnhart, which you both actually started working together from that show. Yeah. Well, we went to college together, Jen Barnhart. Uh, really? was, an act, was an acting major at University of Connecticut, and she comes and. She had such a wonderful voice that the puppetry department convinced her to take a puppet class. So we got to spend some time and help her learn to be a puppeteer. She's a, an amazing puppeteer and an amazing yes. actress. All, all so yes. talented, she's so great. good. Yes. She's the best and just a lovely human. But she and I have been friends for ever. So yeah, so we met before we were both drinking age. How about that? Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. wow. That's, that's, but, yeah. that's something. She's the best. Yes. Yes, she really is. Yeah. Um. Okay, we okay. You have a lot of shows like that you've done puppetry for, but one of them I would love to talk about is the loveliest world of Doctor Such. Loveliest world think, of Doctor Seuss. Yeah, I also I know that you puppeteered various characters on that. What was that like? What was the experience on that? That was a, also another one of those like anomaly, very different shows. Um, yeah. uh, first of all, just being able to spend time with Stephanie DeBruzzo. Always, oh, I always oh, love. Yeah. I love Stephanie. Yeah, yes. Stephanie, I've done a lot of shows together, and I love working with her. Love and I got, again, it was another Kathy Mullen joint at first. Um, but the great thing about that show was that they had new characters every week, so it wasn't. It was. It was. It was more like Saturday Night Live. Normally, in a puppet show, you get one puppet, you play that puppet all the time, and you play that one character all the time. But on uh, on that show was every day you came in. Okay, you're a monkey. Okay, you're a clam. Okay, you're a talking rock. Okay, you're, a... and we all get to, and we all get to try different voices and just be weird, and uh, uh and and uh, and try stuff. And plus, we were trying that new uh, a new technology which everybody uses now. But back then, uh, the virtual sets. We were in a tiny tiny room with a blue screen, and all those sets were digitally rendered. And you could tell they looked like a video game at the time. Yeah. And the computer they had to make that set was the size of my room. <laughs> it was just like, this. and they had to put it in a separate room with four air conditioners on it, blowing on it because it was moving. It was rendering so hard that it was overheating and, and killing the chips. So like they had like these had like these heat sinks that were about that long all over the chips, and they had just like five air conditioners blowing on that room, uh, just to make it go. And uh, all one camera. But uh, every day we all we just kind of come up with stupid voices, and then we all go, "Okay, what are we doing?" Well, like uh, I think all the hat, uh, the 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 um, the Wickersham monkeys, everyone did like uh, oh. um, you won't even know this. The James Mason is an actor from old movies that you guys wouldn't know. James Mason, you know, decided that monkeys all sounded like James Mason. But we know <laughs> it was just, uh, uh, it was a fun to be able to have that kind of a challenge to come up with a new character every day. And find a new way to interpret what they were handing us every day, and it was a very, it was a silly show, and also had that doing some really new stuff with the virtual set. Like there was things that weren't in the room, like there were tables that weren't in the room, and you'd walk in, and you would be in front of the table, but you had to walk behind the table. You had to get just past the table, and then they hit a button, and it would 
put that in it would change that layer so you could fake walking behind that table we were just like walking oh. back and forth but if, if we knew like okay i want to walk in walk this so there's a guy in the computer programming all the the, the set pieces so if you want to walk behind something he'd go click or if you want to be behind a window uh, you know, they would they could put you on that half of the room. So it was a lot of us kind of playing around and trying to do weird things with virtual sets. Uh, and because it was so new that they wanted us to try that uh, um, and play with things like this. So it was a it was a great sandbox. Um, and my other favorite thing about that is when we uh, they did a redo season two, they changed. They got a different person playing the cat. Marty Robinson playing the cat. Oh, yeah. And they, and built they a changed new, the format and they paid the format and they built a real set. For just the cat stuff and uh for the cat in the hat's house and we all got cats and they gave me little cat pee <laughs> which made me very happy i would sit around and make cat <laughs> pee jokes i'm a little cat pee you can always smell me you can always smell me coming you can't really get ever really get rid of me i'm cat pee <laughs> I, obviously none of that made it to air but <laughs> it made me laugh to no end and <laughs> And also, I got in the, in the just any time I can spend uh, working with Marty Robinson and with Marty. I was, that's a great group. With Marty Robinson and Stephanie DeBruzzo and John Kennedy, and John Kennedy was a puppet captain on that. Oh, He's so that. such a talented, talented guy. Uh, uh, um, who else was on that show? Um, Anthony Asbury, Marty Robinson. Uh, St I think. Oh, Leslie Carrara. Yep. That's for Leslie. Uh, that's Leslie. Leslie. that's Leslie. the show where Leslie uh, Crown oh, yeah, and, and I, Blues too. Bruce and the Noel. Uh, Blues was much later. Yeah, but uh, uh, just, uh, that was the first time I got to work with Leslie. Uh, uh, that's when we, and that's when we and I, she and I decided discovered that we were long lost brother and sister, to the point where she, my mother, came to visit the set and she walked up to my mother and she says, "I'm not mad. I just want to know why you gave me up when we were we we're obviously twins and you obviously gave me up and I had a great life in California, but." <laughs> my mother's like who's this weird lady talking to me You're like that's leslie. <laughs> exactly. yeah that's, that's leslie so um there's also been a number of shows where you kind of worked as an ensemble uh puppeteer and one of those uh projects was on the disney series bear in the big blue house what, uh, what, what was it like working on that i only did a couple of days on bear uh because bear was shooting at the same time as we were shooting lions or any other things too that was the back in the the heyday of the 90s everybody had a puppet show uh there were so many puppet shows uh so but every once in a while i got i uh i did one big they had one big day when they was like the, it was like the, the tutter family reunion episode uh, yeah. oh yeah and I had I played the tutter with the with the fez. I played jet setter tutter. Yeah, baby, yeah. Uh, but you know, at, at, at that point, every puppeteer we were in New York, we were all friends, and so you'd show up to any one set, and it was just like old home week. The same like, same camera guys, the same directors. It's like you go on any other puppet show, and you're like, oh, okay, what show is this on? And of course, Noel McNeil is so amazingly talented. Uh, the the most remarkable thing about Bear, and every time I'd go on the set, is he had something that no other walk around character had at that point. It was brand new. They did it for Bear. They put a camera inside of Bear's eye. So normally, I'm sure you you guys have talked to enough puppeteers. You know how Big Bird works as a monitor. Yeah. So yeah. Big Bird mm -hmm. can't see out. It he has to, it makes it look like he's looking at you based on using the monitor, using the monitor work. Uh, Noel had two monitors. He had a monitor seeing what the cameras were seeing, and he had a monitor seeing was because he was on a raised set. Bear, Bear was a raised set, and there were traps all the time, and it was just safer for him to be able to kind of point Bear down and look at the floor. No, he was make sure he wasn't falling through a hole because if mm -hmm. Noel got hurt, production stopped. Right. So yeah. obviously, Bear's dead. We can't make any more bear shows. Right. So, right, yeah. right. But the remarkable thing about that is he would walk around the studio and if the cameras weren't on him and I walked in one day and I was delivering something and bear turned and looked me in the eye and went, Hey Tim, happy birthday. And he gave me a hug and I went, how? And I didn't know about the camera. And I was like, how the hell are you doing this? <laughs> Yeah. How the, it was a magic trick. It was a magic trick. He was like, how the hell are you looking right at me? And he was walking around the room like like he wasn't on camera. Like, oh, this bear. Because, you know, bears, this is full costume. 
it's all he's he's in that thing just walking around just like like in that jumping over things stepping over wires like how are you doing this like they gave me a camera so i wouldn't fall in the hole (laughs) but Mm. for a whole five minutes see i was just like i'm wrapped i'm like how this is a magic trick and how are you doing it (laughs) oh man oh that's great so another Disney series you got to work on was The Book of Pooh, which used tabletop puppetry. What was it like getting to work with that kind of style puppetry compared oh, to I, Muppet I, style? I, I trained in that in college. I'm actually one of the really? more experienced people in in, in, in team puppetry mm. uh, uh, because we did a lot of it in, at, at UConn and stuff like that. A lot of Boone Raku, or not really Boone Raku, but Boone Raku style uh, um, uh, team puppetry, and which is why I guess I got a lot of work doing it because I was, I was kind of... I could, I could make people look good. Uh, the person, the, the tricky, the, the, here's the secret. Whoever's doing the voice in the head has the easiest job. <laughs> they put the least talented puppeteer on the head. That's what we used to say. Just <laughs> them. And you put the really talented people on the feet and the arms because they're making them sure they look like they look balanced. It's a lot harder form of puppetry and also a lot more limited what, you're like, uh, uh, what you can do. But uh, that was fun. So, and I know, um, cause they had like kind of different teams for each character. Do you remember what, uh, kind of team you were on? Like which character you got to work with? I was originally on team Pooh when we pitched the show to Michael Eisner, we all got flown, to, we got flown to California and it was Marty Robinson was playing bear and, uh, Eric Engelhart and I were his assistants. So we were doing it in a very unusual way, but cause we had to do it in the boardroom at the Disney studios to show them what Winnie the Pooh could do. Uh, I'm going to tell a story I'm not supposed to tell. So we're in the room and Michael Eisner walks in and it looks like he just had lunch. He had food all over his suit. He looked like, he was, <laughs> I'm like, this is how you came to your meeting, just covered in food. Okay. Uh, and we bring out Winnie the Pooh and he climbs up on the table, walks around, does a little talk like that. And everyone's like, what? It's amazing. And Michael Eisner goes, okay, hold, let me understand this. So he's a beautiful puppet. He's very successful. From the waist up, he looks very, he looks just like Winnie the Pooh. But from the waist down, he looks kind of like a doll. He doesn't look real. He, why, why, why would you do that? And, and Mitchell Kreeman had to go, uh, well, you know, in the book, Winnie the Pooh is a it's a doll and in the cartoons we the poop is a is a doll <laughs> it's like you have to, you have to tell, tell michael eisner he's wrong to his face it's like yeah. oh oh so that's a concept okay all right okay all right <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the number one products of your company and you didn't understand that Winnie the Pooh. he thought Winnie the Pooh was actually a bear and not a doll that was anthropomorphized by christopher robin <laughs> but <laughs> I love that story. Yeah. We're sitting there and we're just standing there kind of going, are you going to tell him? I'm not going to tell him. Are you going to tell him? I'm not going to I'm not just like, someone's going to tell him that this is, a, he's actually a doll. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, um, moving on to Between the Lions, where you got right. to play, uh, characters like Artie Smarty Pants, Buster Field, uh, Gus everybody. The, I Gus played the all the puppets, all of them. <laughs> a bunch of characters. Uh, how, how did you kind of begin working on that show? Uh, again, that was I was kind of Team Mullen. I was one of Kathy Mullen's, uh, and that was kind of before a lot of the other shows. Uh, 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 and Michael Frith and Kathy Mullen and I were, were, were friends and worked together for years. And they were doing some, they wanted to do some weird stuff. Uh, and, you know, the basic library stuff was all like you know Muppety and style and like that. But it was all the other segments, all those other kind of unusual little like puppet segments that we would do, like Sam Spud and uh, yeah. and all the other things. And they wanted me around because I. That's the kind of stuff I did. I really, I trained as a Muppeteer and I was one to be Muppeteer, but I went to puppet school and I learned uh, Muppets is to puppetry what rock and roll is to music. It is a very small and very popular segment of a much larger art form. You know, I trained in marionettes. I trained in shadow puppets and hand puppets and, and, and rod puppets and all these different forms from around the world. And I wanted to use them in films and Kathy wanted to do the same thing. Kathy and Michael wanted the same thing. So they wanted me around. So when we made these films, because a lot of guys are only comfortable just doing the Muppet style puppet. If you hand them a rod puppet or something else, they go, they don't know what to do with it. And I'm comfortable with any, with any puppet. Hand me a marionette, I'm fine. So we wanted to try some new visual things 
uh, with that. So uh, that's why they gave me already smarty pants. It was a weird puppet. The, the weird puppet gives the weird puppet to Tim. Um, hmm. uh, and, but we also that also wanted us to kind of get really silly. And and uh, uh, I, I, that I can do. I can get really silly. But uh, we had, I mean, I love doing the regular segments and the lot, and I love doing Peter Lynch's hands for the to Theo because I would challenge him. I would just do, I wouldn't tell him what I was going to do. So he's Call doing the Peter. head, and I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. I'm like, just go. Why would he do? I don't know. I'd pick things up all the time. If you watch the show, I'm picking up books and opening things and throwing things and making things disappear and stuff like that, and just to mess with him. And he loved it. We had a great time. He loved the challenge uh uh doing that we had was so much fun but i liked not being a lion everything like, oh you did not one of the lead characters i'm like i don't, I don't want to be lead character why not i want to play all the weird puppets that come into the library and i did i played like the rock and i played a little rock and i played a oh god i can't remember i played a storybook i played a oh god that was so long ago don't make me remember uh, um <laughs> Why are you making me remember these yeah, things? It was probably uh, like is it in the room thirteen here? Oh, years, maybe. Oh, wait, since it's been hold on, on the air. hold on. I, I mm-hmm. got some, I got something I'm not supposed to have. Okay, oh, this should be interesting. This, this, this yeah. should be. This should be interesting. Okay, put my headphones back on. Oh my gosh! Is that for, is that from Valve uh, Bootcamp? That's from Bow Boot Camp. I'm very proud about Bow Boot Camp. Wow. 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 That's, oh, all that's, it does. Cool. that's all it did. We bought some G.I. Joes and I had to Greek them and I made these uh, and they all had little vowels replacement heads. It was like a dumb puppet show. And it's <laughs> like so I so they would come up with these really silly ideas and I'd go, Yeah, I could do that. Whatever these weird stuff. Anything else around here am I supposed to have? It's so crazy that you have that still. <laughs> Yeah, of course I do. This, I mean, uh, you build these things because uh, that's not the purpose of a puppet. The purpose of a puppet, uh, for TV puppet is the film. Mm-hmm. You, you, people get really precious about the puppet, but the puppets, you only need that puppet for the day. And when you're done filming, you don't need the puppet anymore. You just need the film. So I built all these things to last the day. And then we go away and like, but they're like, oh, they're art. And you save them because that's it. I mean, you, we shot all the Val boot camps in one day. And that was it. And then they were never seen again. They were thrown in a box, and someone was emptying a storage unit and said, "Do you do you want these puppets?" I was like, "Yeah, I do. Send them. Send them. <laughs> all these weird little puppets I made. Send them all." I did. The, I did the segment. I did the uh, King Midas film. I built all those puppets. Oh yeah, yeah. Little little wooden puppets. I get to make all yeah. those. The Czech marionettes. Um, I don't have any of those in here. I think they're out in the garage. Uh I built a lot of uh, um. Yeah, that was that was the exciting part was that we were trying new stuff and, you know, and you had the anchor. And then the other fun thing was if you weren't in a scene, we needed to populate the library and we had all these monkey puppets. So you just grabbed a monkey puppet and you you would go in the background and you try to steal the scene. And I got in trouble once. I got in trouble once we took a monkey and they had for some reason there was a, a samurai sword around. A plastic samurai sword hmm. and it had velcro on it so someone put it in the monkey's hand they were just wielding it around i'm like okay come up to me in the library it would be up on the balcony and i would you come to me and then somebody swing the story around like, okay i took my monkey and i took the i took the head off and i took all the the neck sleeve usually a puppet's got a neck sleeve and i tucked it up inside the head and i put my hand up and i just kind of grabbed onto the head inside so I didn't have my hand in the head. I'm just like holding the head onto the body. And I walked up to him and he went, <laughs> and I let go and the head fell off. <laughs> and it just ran around screaming <laughs> in the background. And the whole crew falls out. And they're like, you can't, Tim, you can't do that, Tim. It's a kid's show. You can't. <laughs> I'm like, he's not bleeding. He just lost his head. We'll put it back on. Oh, we'll man. just chase him around the whole Oh, my God. So, so we would do, we just mess with each other. But that was the thing. We'd always try to be as funny as we could, way in the back. Doing nothing to, to distract from the people who were actually doing the scene down front. So that was a fun <laughs> game. That was great. Yeah. Oh, I love the oh the monkey game. I missed the monkey oh, game so much. Uh, mm. Yeah. So um, I know um a lot of uh, Between Alliance fans are kind of uh, wondering um, is it fine if we can hear a little bit of Artie's Smiley Pants? God, I'm gonna blow you out. I think to do Artie's voice, you have to do it very loud. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, ah, that's a smarty pants. It's like that. Just me doing Roberto Benini. 
that that that's great. That is that, great. That's an awesome. it's, it's just me doing Roberto Benigni with a, with the scariest puppet. I have played the two scariest puppets on TV. Name you know what's weird? I never, I never, as a kid, I never got creeped out by Artie Smarty Pants. No, I don't know why. Either. Well, me you're either. a weird kid. You're a weird kid. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, for two seasons, you were the understudy for Theo Lyon. Uh, I know you had kind of talked about Peter earlier, but what was like being an understudy for Theo? I wouldn't call it an understudy. Um, Peter, uh, there was a conflict between between the lions and uh, Bear in the Big Blue House, and Bear in the Big Blue House paid better, so Peter made the choice because he had a family, and went to work on uh, a bear. Uh-huh. So uh, someone else needed to play Theo. So I was there every day. I know the character, and I could do it a pretty good approximation of Peter, uh, and I did it. Uh, now there's a whole new generation of puppeteers playing all the people's characters now. Matt, you know, Matt Vogel and uh and, and Eric and all those guys are playing on it. And uh I hated it. I I don't know how and we've had Matt and, and Eric and I have actually just sat around and talked about this, how hard it is to play somebody else's character. And and oh, yeah. they even have it even harder, the beloved characters. Because yeah. no one's ever going to the best response you're going to get is good enough because you're not allowed to make it your own you're always second guessing yourself you're always thinking about how would they do it or what do people expect of this character you are working so much harder to play these characters than you would be just if it was your own and you can make your own decisions and make split second moments you're just thinking so much harder and taking like that Eric's got such a hard job following uh Frank Oz. Yeah. He does a great job, but I mean uh Matt got lucky with one with uh, uh Uncle Deadly. Uncle Deadly never had a real character. He was just Jerry Nelson doing and Matt's been able to kind of make it his own. I guess people oh, didn't yes. care enough about the Uncle Deadly. I mean I did because I'm a nerd. But <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> uh, uh playing somebody else's characters is is uh why it might be a great gig. It's not fun. You're oh, you're never gonna trust yourself, and no one's ever gonna love your work. You're always like, mm, it was good enough, it was close, didn't sound right, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, and it's all, yeah, and it's I, like, oh, good. It's it's really hard to like fill big shoes. I mean, if you think about it, like Steve Widmeyer when he had to fill in gym shoes for Kermit, like it's always a struggle. Like when you're like, like, well. I, I don't know. Am I going to do a good job? Like, it's the things you have to think about when you're, you know, taking over. A it's, character. A, it's always in your head. You can't get it. Yeah. You can't get away from it. And and that makes your job much harder because you need to be able to kind of, especially doing puppetry. You're remembering your lines. You got to remember where you're going. You got to get it right. You got to work with other people. You got to work with the camera people. You're, you're, and, 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 and you, you want to, you don't want to, you have to kind of be able to let certain things go into autopilot. And if it's your character, you can kind of go into autopilot. Like Artie Smarty Pants, I could just do Artie Smarty Pants. I know. Yeah. I'm I'm in that character because I created it. I don't. And if I change something, that's fine because I created it. Um, if you change something with Kermit, you have to consult so many people. Yeah. Like yes. you, know, I, you guys don't think it's all right if Kermit does this, you know? And, right. Uh, yeah. It's just the the, the the nature of the gig, um, but it's a hard job. Yeah. Um, so you got to work on a noggin show that I think pretty much everyone in this room like knows about Ubi. You got to be the lead character in Ubi. What was what was it like working on that show? Uh that's the other weirdest puppet on TV. That's <laughs> Ubi and uh so I did a sh- uh, when I was in college I did a show called Show of Hands which was a, a show that was just my bare hands. No eyeballs, mm-hmm. just my bare hands. Uh, and it was uh, it was not even this. It was just it was called hand mime. It was actually invented by oh. a Russian puppeteer, but Bill, but Bert Hilstrom, who did Kuklinali, did a bunch of segments for variety shows back in the '60s that I had seen, and I fell in love with it. And when I was in puppet school, you you learn hand mime before you learn puppetry. It's just it's just kind of the process, the part of learning how to be a good puppeteer is learning how to do puppetry without puppet first. Uh, and um, Josh Selig, who created the show. Went to Nickelodeon, and I and Nickelodeon had produced a couple of my segments of the bare hands 
puppet segments that I did from college, they put on Nickelodeon. They're called Show of Hands. There's little black and white films. I think you can find them online right now. Uh, and they went to Nickelodeon. And Nickelodeon was like, oh, well, you got to use this guy, Tim, for the pair hand show. This is a guy who's already, we, we love him and he's already that. And he was like, well, actually, I really wanted to use Marty Robinson. Uh, he's a very talented guy because that's where I learned it. Because Josh Selig saw him, tr Marty, training puppeteers. And that's how you train puppeteers. You just get, uh, uh, I just had a pair here of those peeps in my hand. Hmm. Let me be cleaning my office. I'm going to put them away. Um, uh, Marty, you know, was like, I want to use Marty. And they came to both of us and we were like, you know, we have a company together. <laughs> you know, Marty and I are a business together. You can hire both of us and it would be it's fine. <laughs> like, oh, so I ended up, you know, we did an audition and I ended up being a newbie. Uh, I, I, I'm doing this too because uh, I just inherited a box of the original Ubi eyes. Oh, Ooh. oh! Um, I put pause. I think they're in the safe. <laughs> I think I put them in the safe. My wife was like, they were out, and my wife was like, "Could you please put these somewhere safe?" <laughs> and I was like, right. oh yeah, that's probably a good idea because they're really delicate because they're made, they're glass, uh, German glass doll eyes. They were put on really thin wires that Marty made. Uh, uh, uh. But yeah, come on. Uh, it was, I was like, you guys know, there was a show back in the day called The Soup. I've heard and of it, was, it, I think. It was on E! So and every day they would kind of talk about what was happening on daytime television. At the end of the mm -hmm. show, they had a segment like the weirdest thing that happened on TV this week. And I was on that five times as Ubi. Oh, wow. They would show the Ubi clip. Like, this is the weirdest thing that happened on TV. And they'd show an Ubi clip every time. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's the most recognized of things that I've done. Like, I get more emails yeah. from people who loved Ubi than any other thing I've ever worked on. Uh, certain, uh, certain uh, either parents saying, thank you. My kids love it. Or kids like finding like, oh my God, I love Ubi. Uh, I was at... Uh, I was out. I was at the Magic Castle a couple weeks ago, and someone was like, "Well, yeah, what do you, you know, was like you sitting around waiting in line? What do you do, puppeteer?" Oh, I have this puppet show I used to love as a kid called Ubi, and I was like, "Did the hand look like this?" <laughs> <laughs> they freaked out. I was like, "You know, uh, definitely the weirdest thing I ever worked on." I mean, a bare hand puppet that uh, uh, only, only spoke in three word sentences. But uh, um, what's your favorite episodes? Oh gosh! Oh, oh my I, goodness! I, it's I, been a while. So it's been it's it. been a long time. There, I never had the opportunity of, to. Be there are a lot of them too. Um, I think there were some that were there were some like grocery store ones. I think. Yes. Yeah. There were some oh, yes. of those. Um, oh, there was there was a camp out one. Yes, that's oh, a good camp one. That one, yeah, yeah. Um. Uh, hmm. There were a lot of good ones. There was a hide and seek one that was fun. Right. Uh, my favorite is the uh, Little Red Riding Hood musical. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. Ah, yes. When we sang, it made more sense to sing in three word sentences than it did talk in three word sentences. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. work for me, but it, it got really melodramatic and silly. And uh, my friend uh, James Godwin played the the musical director playing piano oh, and conducting James. and like that. And uh, James is the best. And, uh, um, uh, and, and I think, Oh, and then we had this weird thing where, that, you know, we're grown ups and we're making a kid show. And it's very rare that you're on a kid show. that doesn't have kids around. So on that show, there were no kids around. It was just grown ups. Uh, and so in between takes, I, I, Production's hard and you work really hard and you get really tired and you have to do things that kind of keep your energy up. So we get silly in between takes things, you know, they weren't for the show. They weren't for the general public. It's just for us. Uh, and uh, Lisa Buckley played this character with an accent, this lady character that would flirt mercilessly with, with grandpa and say just horrible, dirty things to him all the time. So uh, just, just between takes, just to make us laugh. Cause it's inappropriate. It's inappropriate for kids shows characters to say horrible, dirty, horrible things to each other. So she would do it and it'd be all laugh. And they finally use it the show. Like she, like, I think in that episode, she's like kind of flirting with grandpa. They said, it's like, Ooh, they have a little moment. 
which people might think is cute, but we think is hysterical because we know the backstory about all the, whole, the terrible things that she would say to him. And he back, they would just get really just raunchy just to be silly. No, no, there's no videotape of it. You're never going to find any of it. It's totally in my head, but it made, it's we just do things to make each other laugh. And uh, that there's certain things that make it to tape that just to remind you that uh, like, Oh God, when they would flirt, it was so funny. I think there's a couple of episodes they've flirted. I think she came back a couple of times, you know, it's kind of like, and he would get really uncomfortable. <laughs> just make me laugh. <laughs> that sounds like good memories. Mm. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. one of my uh, one of my personal favorite shows that you got to work on was uh, Johnny and the Sprites, where you got to ah. play one of the Sprites, Basil. What was Love it like working show. on that show? Um, you have Broadway stars writing. Uh, you're working with Broadway stars every day, and you have uh, Broadway composers writing music for you every day. Uh, and they always give me these impossible parts to sing. I am the least talented singer on that show. I am the least talented singer on that show. There's John Tartaglia and Leslie Carrara and Carmen Osbar and amazing talent. Well, and then there's nice. the weird, awkward, straight white man who can't sing. So, <laughs> oh, and they would get, so the poor musical director would just have to, it was just Gary, oh, bless him. We'd have to just really work on my musical part. Luckily, we would pre record. But I actually have all the charts because I, I, I uh, even though I'm not a great singer, I know how to read sheet music. So they would print out the sheet music for me. So I have a whole folder of all the sheet music from all the songs from that show. Uh, um, just great music. And, uh, you know, uh, um, and, I, and I got the great thing about that show. I got to direct and they would give me the like the the, uh, the, the technically difficult shows to direct. I did the one with the Sprite Shrink. I directed that episode. I'm very proud of. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, nice. Nice. Yeah, there, there are so many, like, great episodes and songs on that show. Like, I remember one when we interviewed John Tartaglia, one episode we talked a lot about was the uh, Sprightly Holiday episode, I think it was called. Yes, very, very Sprightly yeah, Holiday. Yes. 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 Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And the, um, the Dr. Basil, Basil's Band. Um, Basil and the Beanstalk. Yeah, Basil had a lot of Basil. episodes. A lot of really Basil. episodes. Well, there are only three on puppet him. characters. There's only three puppet characters. Four puppet characters. So. I know. Oh yeah. Out of all the you kind of split up the episodes. Of who there's who's right. about? Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. And the one the shorts the laugh Basil laugh, where it's just it was. Oh yeah. The, when the it was shorts originally the shorts. Where it was only Johnny, Before Basil, and, and Ginger. Oh, that was the beginning. We did the shorts first before it became a series. They yeah. tried it out of shorts yeah. first. It was just it was just Ginger and Basil and uh, and Johnny on those. Yeah, because Lily and we wasn't like Lily wasn't around, and neither was uh, um yeah. um um what was Heather's character with the red hair? Root. 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 Thank you. Been a long time. It's been a while, guys. It's been a minute since I made that show. <laughs> uh um no worries but and actually though, though uh, again uh, on that show it was fun but also um jim krupa who's an amazing puppet builder an amazing puppeteer and a great director too um he made those puppets and he would make he's the best puppet mech builder on the planet and but he would make he would come up with weird ideas and some people would kind of get scared of his mechs and i'm like oh no give me the weirdest give me the hardest mech you can make <laughs> That puppet had the hardest mech I've ever worked on because I uh, had the ability to move the pupils around with my middle finger. So if you look at that show, Basil's pupils move up to inside those glasses, up, down, left, and right. I have the full universal. So usually on a puppet, if it's got to move, you've got a trigger, and it, they just move either left and right or up and down, not both. So imagine with that one hand, I'm lip syncing all the time and emoting, but also I have to keep track of where my middle finger is. To that, And the way the mech works is if I want the puppet's eyes to look up, I pull down. If I want the eyes to look down, I push up. You're the back of the eyeball. Do we have a ball here? I had a ball here. I was playing with it. Dropped it. Um, so you have the ball. So like, here's the front of the ball. You want that to look down, you lift up. Mm -hmm. So you know, if I want the so the, if the eye look up, you're pulling down. If you want to look left, you push right. You want to right, look, look left. So if I want to go up right, I have to push down left. All of my middle finger the whole time. But there was a spring, so if I let it go, the eye pupils would snap back to the center. So if I ever got lost, you just let go, and I could look straight again. I wouldn't get completely lost. But um, that was another level of my brain that I had to use to do that. But 
uh, it gave that puppet some great things. And I did things like, something that Johnny would call acorn eyes. And it was just me looking. I would like look down. I would like look, look down and pews people's right at the top of the glass. So I'd be looking at them like, Johnny, 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 could you just come on? And if, if, we, if I ever wanted anything, if I ever wanted anything out of Johnny, I just do acorn eyes. Johnny. Like, oh, acorn eyes. I can't stay. Then, okay, whatever you want, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh that's yeah. Great. Uh, so, um, you got a puppeteer for Sesame Street for a few seasons. How was that experience? Come on, don't you want a puppeteer in Sesame Street? You Sesame Street. I, it's amazing. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. It was about the best. But you know, the, the funny thing is. You know, I remember when I first got to, Marty first invited me to Sesame Street and I cried. I uh, walked in that room. Uh, I walked uh, in that room. How do you not? You walk here. I've watched it my whole t life on TV and I'll exactly. sit in the room and I was right? like, oh my God. Yeah. And then what, what was the first, what would be the first thing that you would do if you got to visit Sesame Street? Got smacked. Hmm? Got no, no. Smacked. What was the first thing that you would do? Oh. oh. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I like what? Maybe take it all in. Uh, meet Big Bird. Look, look at look inside Oscar's trash can. Oh, oh yeah, mm, yeah. Sweet, You're like oh my gosh, not about it's, inside me. Of like what's uh, uh, spoiler alert? It's what's very happening? disappointing. It's very disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, maybe look inside to see if Grouchland is actually real. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Your whole yeah. life wondering what's going on in that trash can, and you open up, right? it's, just a, it's just got a hole in the bottom. It's just a hole. Yeah. yeah. Very disappointing. I mean, to ruin the magic for anybody, but it's just a hole in the bottom of that bag. But you have to know. You have to look. You have to go. What's inside right. Oscar's trash can? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. right. And then the next thing you do is you go sit in Big Bird's nest. Yes. 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 And oh, then uh, 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 we got invited to uh, the, they have, they would have a big Christmas big Christmas wrap party. The show would always kind of wrap around Christmas. They'd be a holiday party, and they would have a party. And they used to have the party on set. So they would decorate Sesame Street for Christmas and they put all the food out and we'd sit on Sesame Street and have a party. Uh, and so we were actually sitting in Hooper's store drinking beer. And I was like, this feels wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we should not yeah. be drinking beers. We're just sitting at us in, in Hooper's store at the bar drinking beers. This would not feel right. <laughs> but it was fun. Right. Yeah. And and, yeah. and and they're all my friends now. That's the thing is that everybody on those shows are all just for... And so it's... it's, it's uh, it no longer has that kind of like that. Uh, uh, oh my, you know that kind of uh, oh, I'm in, a, I'm in a holy place. I'm like oh, I, I know all the camera guys and all the audio people and the music people and the floor managers and the puppeteers and they're all just my friends. And I show up and it's just like great to be like oh, I love all you people, making magic, making magic. So yeah. it's uh, it's always any working on any of these shows is always just a joy. Yeah, and I'm kind of curious. Interesting question. Did you ever get to perform in the Macy's Parade with Sesame? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got pneumonia doing it one year. Oh, wow. Oh, you did. Do you, remember, <laughs> do you remember at all who you were doing? So the one year I got sick, and I did it, I did it a couple of Because back in the day, nobody wanted to do it. And I I loved It's so great just going down the middle of Manhattan and the, every here crying, and you're sitting there with a Muppet on. And, and, we, and I would always bring a thermos of hot cocoa. And said so they were like, I'll go and, 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 you know, and, and just waving to people. And then you do the one song at the end and you're done. Uh, uh, and, but this one year, it was pouring rain. Oh, boy. Whoa. And the parade happens rain or shine. Rain or shine, yep. And that year, they had a new float. It was a brand new float. And they put me in the chimney with Harry Monster. Oh, wow. So they handed me an umbrella. So Harry's got a practical hand. So I've got Harry on and I've got the umbrella and I'm holding the umbrella over the both of us. And I'm just getting drenched. It's not helping me. Harry's getting drenched. I'm getting drenched. What I didn't know below me was they had painted uh, the set with uh, a matte black paint. I think it was a gouache, which is a milk based paint, mm -hmm. which is not waterproof. Oh. And all the water was oh. washing off all the black paint onto all of the Muppets. Oh, no. So, at, and we didn't realize it till the end of the parade. And they had to, we had to run back to the shop and rinse out 
every single puppet. Those people did not get Thanksgiving. They spent the entire day rinsing out Elmo and Grover, and uh, it was just, just it was it was a disaster. It was it, it could have been. Luckily, there the people that work in the New York shop are the most talented in the world, and they know what they're doing, and you know they react to things like this, and they did it. But it was like somebody in the set department is fired. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, actually, Macy's builds it. We don't build the Macy's company is the one that builds all those floats, but it was a problem. Mm. I think we got a, yet a new set since, but a new float since. Yeah, but, it's been the same one. Yeah, it's crazy. It's been the same one for a little while, but yeah, but that yeah. one. But yeah, but I but I was up and up, and I I got home, and I was in, I was instantly had a fever, was sick. I was in bed for two weeks after that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mm, so yeah. as we kind of get to like the last couple questions what was it like uh working on it's a big big world as a it can work? it was the same as working on book of poo except that we uh, uh the thing about big big world was that uh mitchell had bought a studio out in long island and he had to put us all up so he'd uh, uh we were staying in like dorms because there was nowhere to stay out because it was out in the hamptons and the hamptons is very expensive and we were shooting in the summer so he couldn't afford to put us up in actual houses because it'd be so expensive because there's summer rentals where all the rich people go for Brett for the summer. So we had, we were all living in a, I felt like all of a sudden like I'm in a dorm again. <laughs> so we all lived in this one dorm community. We would do that, you know, and, uh, but I had to direct a lot of those. I directed eight of those episodes. Oh, nice. And again, it, it was another version of the virtual sets, but it, instead of just a locked camera that moved around, this camera was on an arm. So it can move anywhere. And it was the best fun thing about directing that was you stand on set and you can see, look at the monitors and you can see that, you know, I'm standing in a big blue room. You look at the monitors and I'm standing in the jungle and I go, okay, give me a, uh, um, give me a wooden floor. And the guys in the computers go, click, 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 click. And all of a sudden, a wooden floor would appear. Uh, give me a palm tree right here. And the palm tree, whoop, no, make it bigger and move it over. And good. That's where I want that. Uh, give me a table. So all the guys, there's a whole room full of computer animators, like click, 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 click. And they'd pull up set pieces and you'd point them and you move them around and go, okay, I'm ready for puppeteers. And the puppeteers would come in and we would uh, all, and we would, uh, and we would rehearse the scene. Uh, um, uh, one, uh, and, but the thing is that we're all teamed puppets, but you know, it was, you can do a lot more because the camera was moving around. And we also had uh, um, uh, the sloth to deal with. Which we didn't before, so we would hide puppeteers behind the sloth all the time. He was kind of we used him as a puppet board, uh, but again, it was another kind of a lot of experimentation. But uh, mm. um, uh, we learned the limitations of team puppetry and um, uh, the virtual sets on that show. We kept trying to do some things that that uh, never happened. We'd have to do a lot of rewriting. Uh, and also, the thing about that show was uh, it was pre-recorded. Because we were all wearing, um, we we're all wearing, actually, I've got a photograph of me on that show. Oh, okay. Nice. Thank goodness we have the mirror so I can see where he's getting it from. I keep this. Let's see if I can do this. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, oh wow. That's cool. So we that's were wearing, you we were all in blue. Uh, and it's so, um, you couldn't talk and make it sound good. I mean, go, go, go take a t-shirt and put it over your face and talk and see what you sound like. Exactly. So we had to, so we had to pre-record all the dialogue and lip sync to the dialogue. So it was almost like making a cartoon more than making a puppet show. The difference between uh, making a cartoon and a puppet shows, you know, cartoon is they really craft the audio first and then they animate to the audio. Uh, puppetry is more immediate. It's more like live. You can change things on the fly. All of a sudden they can, decide I want to say it a little differently or do it a little differently and every take and you get people to react a little more naturally. So there's a little more of a life to that kind of, instead of a very fixed performance, it's, just, you know, it's got a little more immediacy to it. So right. it kind of it, it, having all the technology kind of took away a little bit of the immediacy and the fun of doing a puppet show for me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's maybe we're all such a, such a phenomenal show. Uh, is it, I think it's still out there somewhere. I think some. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. So now on Amazon Prime. Yeah, I recently got added to Amazon Prime, which is kind of cool. No one's paid me for that. I haven't seen a check about that. I'm gonna have to call Bezos. Come on, Bezos. guys. What are you doing? Bezos. Bezos. Where's my money? Are you mad? <laughs> Maybe I am. 
I, <laughs> things have been slow lately. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it makes so, sense. Yeah. Um. Ooh. <laughs> okay. This 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 one's actually for me because I actually am a huge fan of the show, but we got to talk about Crash and Burn scene. <laughs> <laughs> um so um do you have any memories that you would like to share wait wait don't tell me <laughs> uh, no. oh please don't tell me oh my god yeah. oh, oh my god, god. Oh, wow, wow. Yeah, nice. that's, that's awesome i love that that's wow i was thinking that you're that's the reason that's the reason i live in california <laughs> uh, uh, we, uh, uh, I was in New York and they were casting a Disney show and, um, I, uh, uh, I got the part and there's a thing in the union. If you're casting a show and they're shooting it, not where you live, uh, they have to put you up and rent you a car and give you a check every week for food. And Disney said, we don't want to do that, but. We'll give you money to move if you want to move to California. Uh, and I was kind of just 40. And uh, things were kind of getting slow in New York production wise. And my wife was looking for a change too. And we were like, well, if they're going to pay for it, so let's, let's move. So we gave up our Brooklyn apartment and we moved to California uh, to do the show. Uh, and I'm the way they make those shows on the Disney channel is they're like sitcoms. Uh, puppet shows are, are, are shot in New York kind of uh, soup opera style. Rehearse, shoot, rehearse, shoot, rehearse, shoot. You shoot an episode in two days. A sitcom is on Monday, you do a table read for the network of the script. And then that's all, that's your day. And then they get, then you go away and they, the writers and the network get notes on Tuesday. You come back in, all new script. <laughs> the notes. And you do table read. And then you do a rehearsal. And then later that day, you kind of do like a stage play. I call it the off off Broadway. Uh, this some sets up and stuff like that. You're not, you're not filming it. You're just kind of doing it in place. And you try some things with the director. And you do like a, 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 a play of the show on the set. And then, and then the, the writers go, okay. And they see what works and doesn't work. And when it get it on its feet. And they change the script on Wednesday. You get a whole new script <laughs> and you rehearse the show all morning and about four o'clock, all the Disney executives show up and you perform the show in real time. And they've got some costumes and some new props and stuff like that. You try things. And of course, you know, can't do everything you're going to do on the TV show. You kind of do go through it as quickly as you can. But I was on a cart on the floor doing crash the whole time running around. And of course, Crash has got a lot of special effects and weird puppet things that you can't do. So you'd not approximate puppet stunts and like that. So in the afternoon, I would do, we would do it live for the Disney executives, uh, which was arm crushing. Because when you do a TV show, you, you only have your arm up for like 10 minutes at a time. You're in a box with your puppet for 10 minutes at a time. But on, on a show like that, what you're for the whole an hour, I'm doing it live. I'm bringing it for an hour, so and I'm like exhausted. <laughs> I'm, I'm losing weight like mad. And then you get a new script, and they all they all go and they argue about what's funny or inappropriate or inappropriate or whatever. And then the next morning, you get a brand new script, and you have two days to shoot, and you just film the show, the final thing. So every week you did the show a whole bunch of times. It kept changing. So you shoot one show a week, but you're just doing that show all week. So it was like. I was bleary. I, I I would spend my weekends. I never saw California for the first two years because I was either in the studio or sleeping. So, <laughs> um, but it was uh, it was wild. Um, uh, the kids are great. I got very lucky to have the best Disney kids. Oh yes, because I have yeah. worked with some of the other Disney kids, and they're kind of like vat grown. Mm. <laughs> they're like weird Disney kids. They're like they're like stage kids. You know, they're, they're not there. They've never been with real kids. They've only been with actors and they're just very kind of, but all these kids were just, they all had great families and they were so much fun. And we laughed a lot. And they've been, uh, I've remained friends with, with, uh, with most of them. Oh, I follow nice. them on socials and we talk, actually, I just caught up with Cole 
That's uh, right. Was, yes, you did. Uh, I saw yes. that. On, uh, yeah, on uh, he and I uh, always saw that too. Yeah, we always text each other every once in a while. We randomly text each other. Uh, you know, at a certain point, you, oh, I, I didn't have all their phone numbers when they were kids because why is this forty-year-old guy yeah, right. forty old numbers? Right. Uh, but I had all their parents text, and I could text them to their parents. I go, "Hey, tell them this, tell them that." Yeah. Uh, and as they slowly, each of them kind of came adults. I would find we would kind of DM each other, kind of, "Hey, how are you?" Uh, I ran into Juana Gregory at the Magic Castle. She's a supermodel now. Oh. Uh, hmm. uh, and she's the, she, but she's lovely, and her family is lovely. I mean, for someone that pretty, she's way too nice and just a, an amazing human. It's like, oh, you're so nice. You're the best. Uh, Landry, I love. They're like my little sisters. Yep, she they're went all, like, on they're to, all my little sisters. She went on to do some wonderful things too. Best friends whenever. Yeah. Sold yeah. her house, whole bunch of yeah. things. Yeah, she's uh, she deserves it. She's so talented. Yes. And then, of course, uh, McKenna Grace. Oh my God, she's in everything. Oh my gosh, now. yes. Uh, we Another. had Thanksgiving together. When she, when she was a little kid, we had Thanksgiving together uh, with one of the head writers at a big Thanksgiving. Oh, I haven't cool. talked. To, I haven't talked to her in forever. She's too big a star for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm. I'm. Yeah. I was just one of the rungs on the way up for her. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but Cole, I bet Cole and I every once in a while he knows that I'm a, a a pizza snob, and he would go to really bad pizza restaurants, take pictures, and go, "Tim, this is the best pizza." I'm like, you shut up, you shut up. That is a lie. You are lying to me about pizza. <laughs> he is really funny. He's a really funny kid. Oh my god! I fought for him originally when uh, we uh, they, I got cast, and they kept bring, flying me out to L.A. to audition with uh, Bernstein's with with Wyatt Bernstein's, and they kept all these kids would come in and. Uh, the Gary Marsh was the president of Disney at the time. And he's like, what do you think? And I'm like, Cole's funny. He's naturally funny. And, you know, and he's just like this really normal looking kid. I think he'd be great. So I really, I really fought hard for him. Um, so there's one episode. If you watch it, the episode where crash gets sick. Oh no. Yeah. I, I know that one. This is my story. This is this crash story. I always get to tell. So in the script, originally, Crash would vomit and vomit and vomit, and that ball would fill up with vomit until it got to by his neck. That And Disney was like, no, no, you're not doing that. No. And come on, it's sick. It's funny. It's a puppet vomiting. It's funny. No, you can't do that. So finally they said, okay, the ball can't fill. He can only vomit three times. Okay. So how do you make a puppet vomit? Well, a special effects crew had this uh this uh can this the, the, you know like this, con this container that they filled with purple vomit and they overdyed it. They put all this purple dye in there to make it look good on camera. And they air, they air compressed it and they put it and we were inside of a video game. If you go back and watch it, we're inside a whackable machine. Mm -hmm. So I had to get under the puppet. So it's me and my friend Paul McGinnis, who's my assistant. He was my my, my assistant puppeteer. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I had my arm all the way up through the ball. The crash's feet were about here. So I'm like up crammed up against the thing. And I'm and they get and Paul's doing my hands through the hole. And they gave me a valve, a squeezy valve. They said, you squeeze it, he vomits, you let go, he stops vomiting. Like, okay, great. So we're in the ball, and I'm, I'm in the ball, I'm doing that. And I, I always made sure that. The, the first one, I would look right at Cole and I, you know, because it's glass and I go and I throw up right at him and he would freak out because, you know, he forgot that there was glass there. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, I would just try to freak him out. My favorite. Oh, he, he is such a trooper. God, that kid is so good. Oh, uh, so I would do the, the vomit gag. So uh, we only had a couple of takes. Mm -hmm. So I do but and then the vomit. Bleh. I'm fine. Bleh. And then the third one, I was just going to let it rip. And I went, bah. There was a flaw. It was a hose with a little bit of a crack in it that we didn't know about attached uh -huh. to the tank. <laughs> and the tank explodes. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, you can actually see that in like the little. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll come, yeah don't, that's my that's, that's my punchline. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the tech explodes and I'm inside a black box and I have a monitor with me and all of a sudden this thing of goo just goes splat on the wall in front of me and I'm like Paul are you okay and Paul's not saying anything and I thought it was Paul's brains because all I heard was an explosion <laughs> and a splat and I'm like Paul's dead <laughs> Paul, Paul are you okay Paul, 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 Paul and cut yeah I'm okay Tim 
Why didn't you say anything? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't call cut. I didn't want to ruin the take. Like the take was ruined when the thing exploded, Paul. <laughs> right? This is one of the we, full, like a sick joke. And if we step out and uh. we are covered in purple vomit. And they put oh. so much dye in it that our skin was stained purple. On the back of my on my back, I had a Paul shaped silhouette on my <laughs> back. <laughs> Just, luckily, they gave us clothes to wear because they knew that we might get like stuff on us. So I didn't wear my clothes. It was like this, this, this the throwaway clothes they bought, like some sweatpants and sweatshirts for us to mm -hmm. wear in case in case something happened. Something happened. <laughs> <laughs> Total best. If you watch the end of that episode under the credits, like you were saying, you mm -hmm. see the explosion. They show the explosion of the purple tank under the credits. And uh, and you and what happens is it goes bang and you look at the, the room is full of kids extras. The second it goes, <laughs> look how fast they all disappear. It's like they're gone. <laughs> Everyone's gone. Cole, everyone abandoned me. Cole abandoned me. The kids, all the extra kids abandoned me. Aaron abandoned me. Everyone ran when there was an explosion and I'm trapped under the thing with this purple goo just spraying on me. Gosh, we finally got uh, taken like that, but it was like that was like the that was the craziest day. Like, really, just gonna abandon me? Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks. But oh, the great thing God. about that show is it wasn't educational. Is right, we could yeah, kind of like, yeah. like Wilkins and Wilkins. We got to break the puppet. It was Bugs Bunny. Yeah, you got to yeah. have more kind of freedom in a way. We rolled, like we ran over. Obviously, yeah, we, you still kind of had to watch some things because it's Disney, but you you know, yeah. compared to something like Sesame I mean, Street, they gave him a sword and they wouldn't let him use it. Like, no, no, he just he just he gets to have the sword, but don't he can't stab anything with it. Like, why do I have a sword? <laughs> right. Um, if I remember correctly, I think some episodes had to like like some of the scenes and some episodes have to be changed. I know there was like one episode where. He was like throwing stuff in this trash can. There was like a cannon, I believe, but it got changed into like this like statue of like some line. I'm trying to remember what I think that was that was supposed to be the second episode, but that got turned into the third one. It's where he goes to it's where it's where he goes to high school, I think. Or school. He went to high school a lot of them all the time. <laughs> they made him go to school. Mary yeah. Bird's song, the uh, the the mom was like was like, I just want to school with you. He's not staying here with me. <laughs> um the character uh um uh, uh there was yeah, but uh, well yeah we, we, we made him muscly we made him flat we made him into mm -hmm. a pinata we took it we ripped his head off we like yeah all these things that you just go to the puppet it didn't matter and things that you can never get away with an educational television you know yeah. it, this was like oh a show for 13 year old boys i get to fart great it was yeah. it was just great to be Funny yeah. and to break and to break to find all the different and Greg Ballora was the uh, um was the puppet captain on that uh -huh. and you know there was so and then the thing is they started coming up with weird things like Crash dressing up in different costumes like I'm a Southern gentleman and I was, they was uh, yes yeah I actually have a book over here that that on the last day they did a photograph of Crash in every one of his costumes and they and they made a book out of it and they gave it to me oh, oh that's cool oh. I've got all the crashes in here somewhere. Yeah, you guys have to call me about these. I would, you know, I would, next time I'll have things out. Like I'll have the Ubi eyes out, and I'll have the crash book out. I don't know. Sure. Um, like I was looking through, and you. So, what was your reaction to Crash and Burn scene ending? Because it got cut. Like, like you guys were like on a second season, and it got cut short like way too soon. That's showbiz, man. I I, I, every one of my shows, every show I've ever been on has been canceled because you only need so many, except for Sesame Street. Okay, Sesame Street's been going on for 54 years. Every other yeah. show gets... Uh, the rule of kids' television is you get three. Because every three years, you get a new audience. They age out of your show, and you have other kids who are kind of coming up, and then you don't need any more than three episodes of a show. Mm -hmm. Unless it's outrageously popular, you get three seasons. Sometimes two. Crash was technically three seasons. There's a long season and a short season. Uh, then, uh, they, But they wrote a pilot for him. They wrote a new show for him called Commando Crash. Oh yeah, shot. We oh, shot yeah, this pilot. I've seen yeah. something about that. Yeah, uh, I think that we'll never see the light of day because all of a sudden it was Crash goes to military school, and I'm like, are, are we gonna have guns on the Disney Channel? But they bought it, and uh, we shot the pilot, and then they never they didn't uh, they didn't go with the show. Mm. But uh, mm. uh, it, that's that, that's that's that's. Uh, you have to get used to being told no 
lot to survive show business. You will get told no a thousand times more than you will hear yes. And you have to learn to be resilient about that. And you have to realize that nothing's ever going to be forever, uh, especially in show business. So uh, yeah, between the, between the lines, I got 10 seasons. That was amazing. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Allegra's Window only had three, um, uh, almost every show, three, two or three seasons. Big, big you know, World be, had two. They barely. They got the, they, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. There was, a little there was a little controversy about how that show was produced, and it was kind of produced under, he did some weird things with the financing, and, and P yeah, PBS didn't care for it, so they killed that show. Um, but, you know, because it's a business, and people, you know, yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, uh, and we're, and, and you really don't, you can't make a lot of money in television unless you're a superstar. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty much like a blue collar puppeteer. It's like, you know, I'm a welder, but I'm actually, a, you know, a puppeteer or a puppet builder. <laughs> and though, you know, the, 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 you know, so I only got, oh, two years of work out of crash. Um, but then I was in LA and I started getting hired by the creature shop. Uh, I got to build the dark crystal. Mm -hmm. uh i got to be on the muppets i got to be on the yeah you the, got to do quite a few uh, things with the muppets now oh the thing about the muppets yeah. that 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 abc series um oh yeah the the one that yeah. the the last series not the, not the mayhem or the one before mayhem uh, i got to play every muppet really because really? in the back in the background huh. mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you know, whoever was in the foreground they always wanted to fill the background with someone they went tim go put on beaker tim go put on so and so, go put on Gonzo. Go put on, uh, and go in the background. Go put this puppet on. Uh, and in one shot, you know, because Steve Whitmire also plays Rizzo and Kermit, he was like, "Put on Rizzo." I'm like, okay, so I did Rizzo because it was an over-the-shoulder shot because they shot that kind of one camera at a time. So I'm doing Rizzo, and then Kermit was here doing the scene. And they went, they were, then they go, okay, let's do the reverse. And they kind of flip around, and they kind of go over Kermit's shoulder and get all of Rizzo stuff. So I go, oh, here's Rizzo back. So that's when he switches. Go, and he hands me Kermit, and I was like, nope. No, I'm not doing Kermit. No, it's <laughs> no. fine. Yeah. No, no, I can't. I can't do Kermit. Sorry. No, it's, it's fine, Tim. It's fine. You can just Kermit. I'm I'm not comfortable with that. Like, just okay. I I have little hands. He's like, so do I. I'm like, okay. Because Kermit's head shape is Jim Henson's hand. Mm -hmm. And Steve always said his hand was a little smaller than Jim, so he always trouble. So he what he would have to do is he'd have to do this to make Kermit's eyes look right. So you couldn't just do this. You had to kind of do this to make it to fill up the part of the skull that's Kermit. So I said, just do that. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what episode, but try to go find the episode where they, if you look, they're shooting over Kermit's shoulder and Kermit looks like this. Because my hand's not big enough. Kermit's head is completely caved in. It made it to air. And it's me doing Kermit. And it's just wrong. Uh, I would do, I would do, you know, if if, if Piggy and uh, and Fozzie had a scene together, I would do you know the opposite. Like I was, uh, they would do over Piggy's shoulder. I put the pig on, or I do uh, Fozzie. I you know if, if he was doing the pig. Um, uh, so at the end of that show, I had actually put on every every Muppet by the end of that show, in the background. Uh, um, and then mostly I was doing Doctor Teeth's uh, hands. Uh, I walked on the first day and Bill Burr was like, you play piano? I'm like, yeah. Like, okay, you're with me. Uh, and I, I did a good nice. job of the first day as they kept calling me back. So it was a great gig. It was right. It was, uh, and oh, the food on that show. Oh, a sitcom. They have all the money in the sitcom. They would feed you like seven meals a day. I gained 20 pounds doing that show. That's great. And you had yeah. to hang out at, at, on the yeah, Disney love, lot. love Bill. Right. Yes. Oh, yes. Bill's, yes. Bill's yes. Yes. Love Bill. He's he's yes. he's wonderful. He's such a the lovely best. guy, and he's so talented. And he's been doing a great job. He's kind of making little puppets his own. The best. But uh, yeah. So when so uh, usually when Teeth or Rolf are playing piano, it's me. Oh, nice. Nice. Blue, co blue collar awesome. puppeteer. Blue collar puppeteer. You know, it's like you know, <laughs> I, I'm a, I'm the, I'm the mechanic. Oh, uh, we need somebody to do this. Tim Tim will do that. So yeah. Um. Is it fine if we can hear a little bit of Crash? I can't do Crash ever again. No, I can't do Crash. It's impossible. Why would you want to hear Crash? That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even exist anymore. No one. When's the last time you saw me? <laughs> uh, uh, actually, my favorite is the, uh, Landry Bender's favorite line was, 
uh, I, that she would just say it over and over again. Whenever she would just get bored, she would just say this crash line like, is this Dubai? It's nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. That's great. That's great. And no, I will not face slam you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. That was although I did, see, although I did see an interview for D twenty three from years ago where you did face slam the camera. Oh yeah, cameras I'll face slam all day. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But I, I only face slam. Actually, I want you to think about the face slam. What am I actually doing? I'm actually punching children in the face on t- on national television. <laughs> that is my fist inside a puppet. I'm just basically a face slam is actually me fist punching poor Cole Jensen in the face over and over again and making sure that the puppet eyes didn't hit him because that was actually the hard part. His head was soft. Yeah. And this part was hard. So I had to kind of make sure like I couldn't actually use my face. I had to use the top of my head. But like, oh, someone's paying me to punch children on Disney Channel? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so one of your most recent projects was the Apple TV Plus series, Helpsters. Yes. Performing the character Scatter and serving yes. as puppet captain. Yes, what, and director. What was doing that show? And director, yes. Mm, what was yes. doing that show like? Um, I love that show. Again, it's uh, 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 I got to be with Stephanie DeBruzzo again and Marty Robinson. And Jen Barnhart, and uh, uh, um, we have a new puppeteer from our, I call the Canada Dork, the Canadian oh. Ingrid, who plays um, I have Ingrid Hansen, yeah, she's so great, she plays Hart. Um, and uh, Tim Mickeyon, who created Odd Squad, and mm-hmm. uh, and some of the other, and yeah, uh, um, he's great. Uh, oh god, what was that? What's this? What's the that cartoon on the Disney Channel about the, the mystery house? Gravity Falls. Gravity Falls. Gravity Falls. Ooh. That's right. Gravity yeah. Falls and Adventure Time and like Duh, that. I should have known he's, that. I love Gravity. Right. And he 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 gets how weird a puppet show should be. He his rule was the weird idea wins. So we got to just be so weird on that show, which was so great. Uh, and the the hard part about it is they for some reason I don't know why, they insisted on half the show being shot on location. So we were shooting all over New York City during the pandemic <laughs> outside doing things. But uh, to, to and just to be in the room working with Stephanie and Marty and uh, all my other friends and uh, and being able to do, and, and to do a show so weird. I love a weird show. Uh, and I actually think it's a really good show. I don't know how well it's watched, but um, it was so much fun to do. And I, I wish we could do more. I don't think we're going to be doing any more. Uh, streaming is weird, yeah. But uh, 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 we got two really good seasons of a, of a show that I'm actually very proud of. Nice, that's beautiful. Nice. So, the last uh question that I'm going to ask is a question that we ask all of our guests at the end. Um, so this podcast is called Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, right? When you think of nostalgia, what do you think of, or in your own words, how would you define the word nostalgia? I didn't know there was gonna be a test. <laughs> <laughs> This is homework? I didn't know there was homework. <laughs> uh, a week uh, to get a tone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, nostalgia's got a positive and a negative connotation. And sometimes people get new, too nostalgic about something and then they're afraid that that means nothing new can happen because we really embrace the nostalgia sometime. And and realizing that it's something that was of a, important to us in a certain part of our life, and sometimes that nostalgia maybe the, you look go back, and you look at something that was very important to you at a certain point in your life, and you realize that it was terrible, like Google Fran and Ali or Howdy Doody, <laughs> terrible shows, very important in the American uh, television, um, but uh, I. But at the same time, I need to celebrate those things because I, I have had such wonderful times on all those things I've done. Uh, I, and uh, and sometimes, and especially now, it's great to be able to go back and be able to call, have something around you that kind of brings up those wonderful, happy memories that you've had in your life. Because it's some, some, it's, you need to have that every once in a while. Just be able to kind of go, you know, I've got my Kermit phone. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. I, I used to use that phone. We don't. No, we don't use real phones anymore. 
Right. If only I if only I could hook up the Kermit phone to my, I, to my iPhone, but I can't. I haven't figured out a way to do it. Someone will do it someday. Now it's just on a shelf. But this thing things and I have like a I have like a, a stick stickly props that I made back in the day. It was like it was a back in Nickelodeon. Yeah. I did a character yeah. called Stick Stickly for them and I built all a bunch of weird props like that. And this is these things. I have a Moki Fraggle cell from the animated um Oh, that, nice. that that Kathy Mullen for my birthday, my 40th birthday, she signed and wrote a little thing for me on there. And, oh, and, 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 I, and I have all my Pez because I used to live next to the Pez factory in Orange, Connecticut. I used to drive by it on my way to high school, and uh, so like all the things that just kind of uh, nostalgia can be a great tool to kind of help you get through the day. But also, you don't want to make sure you live in nostalgia. You want to yeah. use it and enjoy it and let it inspire new and more wonderful things moving forward into the future. Absolutely, Gerard said. No. Is that a good answer? Yes. What, do I win? Yes, what, uh, give me a give me a grade plus. right now. A plus plus. A plus. A plus. A plus. The only A plus I ever got in my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Tim, thank you so much for taking the time to do this, man. This was a blast. Of course, yeah. happy to. Yeah. Yes. yes. I'm glad I had the time. Yes, yes I'm glad we're able to make it happen. Good time of pause. Right. Yes. Um, uh, now and, we, and everybody so get out there and get and get and tell Disney to bring Crash back. Yes. 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 And um, yeah. thank Commando you so much enough for what you've doing and uh, sure. what you've done over the years to be a part of our lives. We what you've done in the puppet world and uh, wait, what's next in store for you and uh, you know, me we too. Keep up a great work. With what's <laughs> what's been happening? Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. Uh, keep in touch. I'll let you know when this goes up, Tim. Enjoy the rest of your day. See ya. Yeah. Bye, Tim. See ya. It's good. Yeah. It's it's goodbye from us as well. We absolutely enjoyed our time with Tim Legassi and Cole. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on as a guest co-host. Yes, thank, thank you, Cole. It's my pleasure thank always. Thank yes. you. Yes, um, keep on yes. the lookout for more wonderful interviews coming your way. Links to Tim's website will be in the description down below, as well as his social media and everything. Yes. Um, and as always, what do we say, Jake? Keep nostalgia alive. Take care, everyone. See you next time. See ya. Bye. Bye bye. 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 Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.